Welcome to the Collins Center for the Arts. My name is Jeff Hecker, and I'm provost here at the University of Maine. Thank you for rising. Now we'll have the national anthem by senior Blake Peachy. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Nancy Zimfer. In over 40 years as an educational professional, Dr. Zimfer has attained international recognition for her visionary institutional and community leadership. Over the course of her career, Dr. Zimfer has pushed to new heights universities' power as regional, state, and national economic engines. She has spearheaded community initiatives that improve education outcomes from cradle to career. She has been a leader in setting new standards for teacher preparation, and she has developed initiatives that ensure student mobility, shorten time to degree, and reduce student debt. It is for reasons like this that Politico magazine has called her President Obama's favorite college leader. These are extraordinary achievements over a career of exceptional public service. In June 2009, Dr. Zimfer became the 12th Chancellor of the State University of New York, the largest comprehensive system of public higher education in the nation. Prior to SUNY, she served as President of the University of Cincinnati and Chancellor of the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Chancellor Zimfer is active in numerous state and national educational organizations and is a recognized leader in the areas of teacher preparation, urban education, and university community engagement, subjects of which she has written extensively and has been invited to speak around the globe. At each step in her career, Chancellor Zimfer has crafted and refined a vision of higher education that is inclusive, encourages innovation, and is rooted in addressing the most pressing needs of our nation. Please welcome SUNY Chancellor Dr. Nancy Zimfer. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I, uh, I have to say to uh, Jeff Hecker, thank you for this gracious introduction, but I would have come anyway. I am thrilled to be here. 
so proud of Susan Hunter and so pleased to count her as a colleague. I, uh, I'm very pleased as well uh, to uh, get better acquainted with Chancellor Jim Page. We have obviously much in common and much that I can learn from the University of Maine system and of course from the University of Maine. I had the great privilege earlier this afternoon to join a luncheon which featured the NSF Advance Grant, uh, which really helped found uh, the, uh, the uh, Center for, for Women and Rising Tide. A rising tide lifts all boats. I heard tremendous presentations from all of the women who were present there, and Jeff was there as well as the functioning principal investigator of this grant, and of course Susan Hunter had a role in this as well. I uh, I'm very impressed that you have devoted this week to women in leadership and that it is not lost on you that President Susan Hunter is the first woman president of the University of Maine. I, um, I once uh, heard a student say uh, to me, um, don't you get tired of being introduced as the first woman president or chancellor of whatever? It stopped me dead in my tracks, and I heard myself say, when it doesn't need to be said anymore, it won't be. Until then, we will celebrate. So of course, uh, I have work to do. I have to say that uh, I have been inspired from my first meeting with Susan Hunter, which some of you may know. I chaired the accrediting team for the New England Association of Colleges and Universities in 2009. My host, my greeter, my pathfinder was none other than Provost Susan Hunter. And so uh, seeing her rise to this occasion today uh, says to me the greatest thing that women can do for other women in leadership is to lead. So I've, uh, I've coined my remarks leading with a cause. So America is, uh, is used to big, hairy, audacious goals. Uh, we remember uh, these two gentlemen, they've been contemporized, but you are celebrating the 150th year of the University of Maine and the 153rd year of the founding of the Land Grant Act. And in the midst of the Civil War, these two gentlemen saw the opportunity to create a system of public higher education universal across the country. Of course, we've had other big ideas. Bringing our GIs back and sending them to college was a momentous occasion for not only our veterans, but for higher education. We went on to establish the Pell Grants, which have provided tuition assistance for many low-income students across the country. And of course, uh, I'm from Ohio, so uh, the one on the right, uh, Neil Armstrong, uh, really met the goal that President Kennedy announced that we would put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. So uh, it's only fitting uh, that we have another big idea on our plate. I am so proud to introduce you now, the President of the United States, Barack Obama. Well, it is good to be back in Buffalo. Good to be back in New York. And we've got all the students in the house. Thank all the students for being here. Hello, Binghamton. A higher education is the single best investment you can make in your future. I'm excited because the great work that uh, SUNY campuses like Binghamton are doing to keep costs down for hardworking students like so many of you. We're going to be partnering with colleges to do more to keep costs down, and we're going to work with states to make higher education a higher priority in their budgets. Now, if we move forward on these three fronts, increasing value, encouraging innovation, helping people responsibly manage their debt, I guarantee you we will help more students afford college. So I had to return the favor. Uh, what he did, however, was give us a charge, not unlike the big, hairy, audacious goals of presidents who led before him, that we could be first in the world in degree completion by 2020. He framed it around uh, what Secretary Duncan has called the iron triangle of affordability and accountability and excess, and said to us, we can do this work. 
One of my favorite columnists from the New York Times, however, said, this puts us in a tricky, troubling spot, a bit of a balancing act. We must make college practical, but not excessively so. Lower its price without lowering its standards, and increase the number of diplomas attained without diminishing not only their currency in the job market, but also the fitness of this country's workforce. So ironically, the two most public and major goals for post-secondary degree completion across America are those rendered by the President of the United States that by 2020 we would be first in the world and the Lumina Foundation which has invested millions of dollars in completion that all adults 24 to 54 would be post-secondary uh, equipped uh, by 2025. And what this little chart shows you is that we're not about to make the 2020 goal for first in the world or the 2025 goal for as many adults as possible, not until maybe 2037 or maybe 2054. This is a troubling, tricky problem. And part of the issue here, and maybe this will ring true with you, is that we are organized in silos. We make public policy uh, in the Department of Education, it affects education, in the Department of Labor, it affects education, in, S in NSF, in HHS, and uh, it does turn out that we're a bit of the problem. In Washington, within the Beltway, there are two major education organizations. We would know the Higher Education Secretariat. It's about 40 organizations that represent universities like the University of Maine and systems uh, like the University of Maine system and SUNY. We also have another group of about 40 K-12 educators, principals, teachers, superintendents, members of school boards, chief financial officers, and to my best knowledge, they have never met with each other. So is it any wonder that we make policy in silos? But there is one guy, again, a favorite columnist of mine from the New York Times, who has a solution for us. If only we could come together on a national strategy to enhance and expand our natural advantages more immigration, more post-secondary education, better infrastructure, more government research, smart incentives for spurring millions of startups. Nobody could touch us. Well, this is my challenge in New York. Each of those dots or stars or squares represents one of the four sectors of the State University of New York. There are, in this portfolio, 64 campuses, and we're thinking hard if only, if only we as a system could come together. So it caused me to look at your map. And while there are a fewer numbers, there may be more acreage to cover in getting our collective act together. So at SUNY, um, pretty early after I arrived, somebody told me that Stephen Colbert had invented this word called truthiness. I thought, this is license for doing the same thing. So we invented the word systemness. We dressed it up phonetically. We gave it a fancy definition. But really, it meant that if we were going to be a true system, the whole would have to be greater than the sum of the parts. Which leads me to, uh, all right, stop, collaborate, and listen. I sit back with my brand new I am told this is vanilla ice. I have no idea, but the people who help with my PowerPoints have a sense of humor, and uh, they're young. So uh, what, uh, what they represent with the vanilla ice is what we've been talking about lately, and this concept of collective impact. So in explaining how we could ever meet Friedman's desire that we as a country get our collective act together. I'm only going to demonstrate from SUNY's portfolio the challenging issues we are facing to make a point. This is not to say we've got it right. It's to say we're struggling with what the meaning of collective impact truly means. So the illustration I'm going to use to make this case is our commitment to access plus completion equals success. 
Um, it's, it's rememberable. Uh, it helps our public policy members understand what we're doing at the State University. And it also helps us organize all the things we're doing to get more students to degree completion, or in the case of our community colleges, two-year degree completion, certificate completion, badge, badges completion, competency completion. And I'll just illustrate this notion of collective impact through three uh, examples from access, completion, and success. So the first is a, an organization that grew up when I was living and working in the University of Cincinnati. This is how the conversation started in Cincinnati. For every 100 ninth graders who complete a high school diploma, only 75 will make it to that finish line. 65, 75, 73, 25 or more are already left behind. Of those 75 ninth graders, only 51 will enter college the next year. And of those 51, only 38, 37 will find their way to their sophomore year in college. And the most devastating national statistic, more or less true this way in every state across the country, is the devastating knowledge that one in five ninth graders will make it to the college and career readiness beginning line for their life's work. So these people in Cincinnati decided they just weren't going to put up with that. It started with our university presidents who said we're not getting the yield from our local public schools that we want. Uh, in a pub, isn't that where we draw on napkins? We thought that what we needed was a road map. We gave it to some graduate students. You can see what happened after that. We asked them to research all the critical ways along the social and academic pipeline where intervening collectively could make the greatest difference. We thought we were working on a project from high school to college until we figured out you can't do well in high school if you don't do well in middle school, if you don't do well in third and fourth grade, if you don't come to kindergarten ready to learn. We uh, settled on a set of ambitious interventions, a framework for getting the right people at the table, for having a shared vision, for using data to decide where and how to intervene and to get investors to agree to only invest in what works. 
And now, as you saw, all those logos, there are over 60 of these communities across the country striving together from cradle to career to seal the leaks in the education pipeline. And perhaps you noticed Westbrook around Portland is one of those members. We have report cards every year, we show our data, we share our vulnerability because we are trying to get our collective act together. How would this work around completion? Well, one example for completion, for saving money and saving time for those students who cannot engage in the residential campus is to exponentially expand the access of traditional age students, but particularly adult age students, to online learning. And Scott and I are in this together. There we go. More than 11 million people in New York State have the need for high-quality, higher education. Whether we meet their needs has consequences. For New York State, for their communities, for them. But today, learners come with real lives. Children, jobs, aging parents, homes, community ties. And they need real access to higher education with strong chances to complete a degree and succeed. They need education that is flexible and fits into their lives. Education with the right supports and experiences along the way that helps them complete a degree and open career opportunities. The world has changed too. With today's technology, online education is more flexible and effective than ever and can reach and engage learners on their terms. Across the nation, other universities are moving aggressively to address the rapidly growing potential and promise of online education. Fortunately, SUNY is positioned well to raise its aspirations to provide high-quality online-enabled education. We cannot miss the opportunity to come together to shape online education for tomorrow. Some SUNY institutions are already tackling the challenge and are well positioned to provide a high quality online education. Imagine what we can achieve if we come together, making the most of the heritage and aspirations of each institution. Imagine if more students graduated because we used online education to help crack the completion code for students. Imagine if prospective students could easily find the online SUNY program that is right for them. Imagine if every New Yorker had access to a high-quality, affordable SUNY degree, regardless of where they live or their ability to be on a campus. Will you open the doors to expanding student access? Will you open opportunities for students to complete their education? Will you open the potential for students to succeed? Will you open SUNY? Like you, we had lots of online course offerings and degree programs, but they were only available to students who were taking those online courses from that particular campus. So we have been heavily diagnosing our digital DNA, and we have figured out that the goal for completion, the goal for collaboration, is that no matter which campus the student is enrolled in, he or she can find online access We've given a concierge, an individual person on every campus you can go to who can hold your hand. We have uh, added uh, uh, online tutoring, online mentoring, mentors across the state. And importantly, we have promised, and I'll say more about this in a minute, that each of our online degree programs will also have an applied learning experience. So we have tried to upgrade online, thinking collaboratively what, as a system, we can do together that is greater than the sum of the parts, including the navigation system that people not used to online learning can engage in. So it's a pretty good example of collective impact from completion, because we know that if the courses online and degree programs online can help more Americans complete, we're closer to the president's goal.
So a third and last example of collective impact comes from our commitment to applied learning. We've given the umbrella name to applied learning for these reasons. Without experience, it's hard to find a position right out of college anywhere. I've been working for two months and I've learned so much more than I could ever thought. What co-op allows you to do is take the questions and topics that you learned in school and find out how they apply to the real world. I'm going to stay on as a, on a project by project basis, but it seems also, again like an opportunity I can't pass up. Uh, we treat our co-ops as employees. We really plug them right into the team. They have responsibilities within the groups. The people that we've had join us are technically excellent. They are highly marketable and will be very relevant in the marketplace and they've been a tremendous asset to us. Students returning from professional experience uh, enrich the classroom by uh, bringing that experience to the classroom. Employers benefit from co-op relationships because we're able to fill gaps in our staffing challenges. I strongly encourage my students to consider cooperative experience because it will enable them to see how the things that they're learning in college will apply directly in a job. In my case, I was fortunate enough in that I was offered a full-time position after my, after my uh, appointment. I think one of the best benefits to co-ops is that they make connections with people who work in the industry that they would like to work in. So what we're learning is that students like to learn through experience, I think this is what John Dewey had to say to us many, many years ago, that applying theory to practice is the best of all learning opportunities. We're not doing as much of that as we should, so we've sort of developed a concept of applied learning that it could include internships and co-op experiences, but also service learning and volunteerism, which many, many, many of your students are already doing, and then increasingly, uh, co-op and internship experiences in a professor's laboratory, in a business, in an entrepreneur, a startup business, so that students can really have that lived experience. And guess what? We cannot do this. We cannot make this experience available to 465,000 students who are educated each year in the SUNY system without collaboration with business and industry and the social sector. We uh, even have a uh, a, a current effort to, for lack of a better uh, uh, analog, uh, do online dating between our students, the businesses, industries, and social service sectors that can provide uh, overseen, supervised quality experiences that we believe will lead to job growth. So uh, access, completion, and success with, a, with an overlay of collective impact. So as the story goes, about six years ago, as Cincinnati was sort of troubling its way through how it could get its collective act together as a community, a couple of guys from Stanford wandered into our community looking for examples of this kind of community collectivity. They were looking at Milwaukee. Uh, a community that was trying to decrease teenage pregnancies. They were looking in Virginia at a water quality exercise, and they came to Cincinnati to look at what we were doing in education. And as is our want as academics, while we kind of knew what we were doing by that time, we didn't know what to call it, but the Stanford guys wrote in the Stanford Social Innovation Review, it's called Collective Impact. It has a framework that instead of a thousand points of light, instead of moving in every direction by every individual program, we would move in the same direction in our case around access, completion, and success, and we would share interventions that work. They created a theory of action looking at what we were doing, and they named each step of the way. You've got to have the right people at the table. This would be the Knights of the Round Table. I think they had a coherent mission. Think of all the stakeholders you have to round up to have collective impact. Jim Collins calls it the right people on the bus, and now he's even talking about the right people in the right seats on the bus. 
This, I think, is the antithesis. This is a lovely cartoon. Albuquerque was trying to do collective impact around cradle to career. The cartoonist captured it. We're always pointing at someone else. And too many times, we in higher education are want to say, if K-12 would do a better job, we would do a better job. Until we remind ourselves that we prepare the teachers who teach the students who come to college, ready or not. Collective impact. Um, I guess these are the Avengers. I have no idea, but I do know it was about justice for all. And one of the code words for collective impact is that you have to have a shared vision. And if there's anything that drives President Susan Hunter, it is her leadership role to help this community create its own shared vision. We were successful at 1,000 points of light. That's the good news, and that's the bad news. We became program rich, but system poor. So this is an anchor concept in the framework of collective impact. And we have to agree on what are those steps where interventions matter the most. In our system, because we have many open access institutions, remediation and developmental education is a major, major expense. How can we work collectively with our colleagues in K-12 so that students arrive not in need of remediation. And this, I've decided, is not cheating. This is sharing evidence. This is taking data to tell us how to fix a problem. These are our freshman students in remedial math. The more remedial math you take, the less likely you will complete a degree. But by intervening, with a prototype from the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching called Quant Waste That Way, we have moved our students out of remediation twice as fast and triply better prepared. And then, of course, to sustain success, as I mentioned earlier, we have to convince our investors from the private sector and, yes, from the public sector that we know what works and that if they invest in what works through us, we can give them this magnificent return on investment. More career-ready college graduates. So it's not easy. Uh, Good to Great is read by many. Jim Collins had to write an appendix, an addendum to Good to Great to explain to us in the social sector that he was not telling us to just act more like a business. He was telling us that discipline is not a characteristic of business. It is a characteristic of greatness. And that fundamentally, we have to find a way to work together. Shared accountability, individual responsibility. So, collective impact and a little poetic license. If only we could come together in Maine and across the country to enhance and expand our natural advantages. Increased access, greater completion, and universal success, no one could touch us. We're that close. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, very challenging and inspiring uh, talk. We really appreciate it. Thank you. We'd like to present you with an historical atlas of Maine. It tells, tells the story of our state from the Ice Age uh, up to the con contemporaries. We hope you will enjoy it. Well, thank you, and thank you all very much, and congratulations, Susan Hunter. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you.
It is now my pleasure to introduce those joining us on stage for the installation of the 20th President of the University of Maine. Please hold your applause until all have been introduced. University of Maine System Chancellor, Dr. James Page. Vice Chair of the System Board of Trustees, Admiral Gregory Johnson. Chair of the University of Maine Board of Visitors, Ann Lucy. Classified Employee Association Representative, Melinda Pelletier. Professional Employee Association Representative, Benita Grindel. Faculty Senate President, Dr. Mick Peterson. Doctoral student, Alessa Sanz. Senior Honors Student, Gwendolyn Beecham. And President of the University of Maine, Susan J. Hunter. Please be seated. Now, on behalf of UMaine undergraduate student body, I am pleased to ask Gwendolyn Beecham to come to the podium. Gwen is a senior honors student who will be graduating from the University of Maine in May with a degree in biochemistry. She is also president of All Maine Women Honor Society. Gwen. President Hunter, Chancellor Page, distinguished guests, members of the university community, and fellow students, thank you. I'm honored to be here today representing the students of UMaine in scholarship, leadership, and the UMaine experience. I appreciate this opportunity to participate in the celebration of the first woman president. I am president of All Maine Women, a UMaine tradition and honor society that recognizes distinguished leadership, scholarship, and service to the university and campus community by outstanding women of the senior class. Each All Maine Women has followed a different path, developing unique leadership skills along the way. I would like to share with you some of my story. Laboratory research experiences have helped me develop critical thinking skills and perseverance. I am studying the genetics of viruses that infect a species of bacteria related to the pathogen that causes tuberculosis. My findings as I characterize these viruses may someday be useful for developing new um, strategies to, 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 to treat tuberculosis infections. There is rarely instant gratification in laboratory research. Many procedures don't work the first time. You have to use critical thinking skills to troubleshoot your experiments and analyze your data. But if you persevere, success can be very satisfying. Laboratory research has proven to me that hard work pays off. On to the next step of my journey. Through my teaching and mentoring experiences, I have realized how differently individuals think and learn. I'm a main learning assistant for a first year science honors course. I have found that each student struggles with a different range of concepts. As I gain more experience as a graduate student, I hope to hone my teaching skills and tailor explanations to meet the needs of each student. In another aspect of my human experience, I received the George J. Mitchell Peace Fellowship to study abroad in Ireland for a semester. I gained confidence in my independence as I traveled and lived on my own in a foreign country. I also learned to take advantage of opportunities and to take risks and be outside of my comfort zone. The different steps in my journey have provided me with valuable opportunities to develop leadership skills, including critical thinking, perseverance, collaboration, empathy, risk taking, and confidence. These are all skills that I use in my role as All Men Women President. All Men Women had the distinct honor and pleasure to meet with President Hunter this past fall and learn about her life path. When President Hunter first came to Orono, she couldn't have known that she would become the first woman president of the University of Maine. 
President Hunter followed her own path to reach her position. And on behalf of all the UMaine students, I'd like to congratulate the President for her many accomplishments. Her story demonstrates that we never really know where our path will take us or what we will learn along the way. I know that I'm excited to see where my path takes me. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen. I'm now pleased to ask Alisa Sanz, a PhD student in history and vice president of the graduate student government, to speak on behalf of the graduate student body. Elise. Members of the University of Maine community, Chancellor Page, President Hunter, I'm honored to represent University of Maine grad students and to share a few thoughts at today's historic installation. When it became official that Dr. Hunter would be UMaine's next president, I remember reading the reaction of many female grad students on various social media. And there was a clear consensus. Everyone was pleased to have a woman running the flagship campus of University of Maine system. President Hunter's qualification for the job, even though praised, were second in order of importance. I have since often thought about this common reaction voiced by my fellow grad students. Two of our own UMaine fellow graduate students are currently experimenting with a project named Follow a Researcher that aims at bringing the reality of fieldwork into the classrooms. Children get to exchange with scientists in real time. One of the goals of Follow a Researcher is to show that scientists are not only old men in a lab coat at a chemistry bench. Scientists are men and women who work in various environments. Just a few weeks ago, the Expanding Your Horizon conference gave middle school girls a chance to connect with women in the STEM fields here at UMaine. Girls are all too often discouraged from embracing such interesting careers based on an outdated gender division of the world. It remains an unfortunate ex exception today to have women attaining a leadership position, such as the presidency of a university. Yet, women such as President Hunter are creating precedents. They demonstrate that women can not only assume leadership position, but they can be successful leaders. Being the Vice President for Grad Student Government this academic year, I've been given a chance to meet not only with President Hunter, but also with many other female leaders in the university's administration. These women represent the very real possibilities for any young girl looking to have a position of leadership, not only in the academic world, but also in a, any career they choose to pursue. We have come a very long way towards full equality in positions of leadership, but we still have work to do. The precedent set by President Hunter demonstrates yet again that those best qualified to lead can and should do so, regardless of their gender. Thank you, President Hunter, and thank you all. Thank you, Elisa. It's now my pleasure to ask Dr. Mick Peterson, Professor of Mechanical Engineering and President of the UMaine Faculty Senate, to speak on behalf of the UMaine faculty. Mick. We are here today to celebrate the induction of the first female president of the University of Maine. As is often the case with anyone who is the first, President Hunter is taking over at a time of great challenges for the University of Maine. Dr. Hunter, they wouldn't have given me this job if, it was, if the times were good. Just look at the economy when President Obama took office. You're facing challenges and you're the caretaker of a great institution. This institution is part of a great American tradition. The University of Maine is the land-grant College of Maine. The Maine College of Agriculture and Mechanic Arts had its origins with a senator from Vermont, Justin Smith Morrill. Mr. Morrill left school at 15 and then developed his business expertise right here in Maine. He was a businessman. His father was a blacksmith. And he understood the industries 
that were the economic foundation of the 19th century economy. While the Morrill Act ensured that military tactics, liberal and classical studies were a part of these institutions, the colleges were first and foremost envisioned as economic engines of the state. The graduates would be farmers and practical engineers who understood the classical foundations of democracy in order to manage local affairs as free men and landowners. The land grant concept was revolutionary with the emphasis on class mobility through liberal and practical higher education of what they referred to as the industrial classes. These ideas are deeply rooted in the American ideals of economic opportunity. Economic opportunity through independent initiative instead of opportunity based on inheritance or family wealth. Women have been admitted to the University of Maine and into all curricula since 1872. The 1890 and 1994 land grant colleges further expanded these opportunities to minority students. This is a revolutionary concept. This is an expansive vision of public higher education. It's helped to create the American economy and these institutions are under attack. The greatest threat to these engines of the modern economy is the belief that opportunity is inherited and that higher education should be segregated by class. Highly selective and well-funded private institutions increasingly stand in stark contrast with repeated cuts to public higher education. Even the children of the men and women who are caretakers of public universities are abandoning these institutions in favor of opportunities afforded by the privilege of their birth. An educational institution which maintains high standards while being accessible to a wide range of students is a threat to some segments of our society. By cutting state funding to high performing public institutions, the economic ladder provided by higher education and technical education is removed. This approach protects inherited privilege and undercuts our economy and our democratic institutions. Beyond the land grant university, all of the leaders of higher education and technical education in Maine face unprecedented challenges. Maine needs to provide a wide range of educational and training opportunities for all of its citizens. Training as a diesel mechanic allows us to keep our fishing boats and skidders moving. But these practical programs are expensive. Engineering, nursing, or dental hygiene do not provide the same headcount per dollar as sitting in a large classroom listening to a lecture. Programs that demand mentoring by professionals are exactly the type of classes that cannot be taught online, but are critical to our economy. The core skills of a nurse, a mechanic, or an engineer demand a two-way interaction between an expert and a student. The individualized education of a PhD chemical engineer may provide the innovation that will sustain our paper industry. However, it currently has less value in the University of Maine system than an adult learner who finishes a general studies degree or a law degree. Make no mistake, quality applied higher education is not cheap, especially if it is provided in an environment which, in the words of the Morrill Act, does not exclude other scientific and classical studies. This is the land grant mission. It's a vision. The greatest human potential in our state and the educational demands of industry cannot be limited to a talented tenth, especially when talent is too often identified based on birth, not on potential. The current emphasis is on providing a low cost degree based on metrics of headcount per tuition dollar while maintaining the cost, while minimizing, while minimizing the cost of highly trained faculty. In critical fields of study, cutting faculty is simply an economic race to the bottom. The University of Maine needs to recommit to the liberal and practical education of the industrial classes. The economy has changed dramatically in the last 150 years. However, these changes have just increased the need for the flagship university. Dr. Hunter, congratulations on being the first woman president of the University of Maine. The institution entrusted to your care will reflect your vision during this critical juncture. 
Booker T. Washington said excellence is to do a common thing in an uncommon way. Think about the agricultural and mechanical arts. That is exactly the tradition of excellence from which the land-grant college has emerged. The graduates of this land-grant college are the key to the economic future of the Maine, of the state of Maine, and the future is now your responsibility. Thank you. Thank you, Mick. Now please welcome Chancellor of the University of Maine System, Dr. James Page, for the installation of the 20th President of the University of Maine and the presentation of the pre Presidential Medallion to Dr. Susan J. Hunter. Uh-oh, he's going off script. Chancellor of Zimfer, President Hunter, members of the stage party, colleagues with whom I include students in that and all guests. Um, as we move forward to better serve the state of Maine with a system emphasis on responsiveness to state needs, whether in advancing student success or leading research that advances Maine's economy or service to our communities, It is both necessary and appropriate that the flagship university take the service leadership role in, better, in building better opportunities for all of Maine. Moving our institutions forward requires experienced, focused, and deeply committed leaders. And this is one of the reasons it gives me great pleasure to begin the charge on behalf of the Board of Trustees and through them, the people of Maine, and emphasizing a point made often today, but not ever too few times, Madam President. In the 150 years that this institution has educated and enlightened the sons and daughters of Maine, as well as many from beyond our borders, 19 leaders have served before you. As with them, we make with you a pact of trust that you will preserve and enhance the University of Maine and work tirelessly to extend its benefits to those who constitute its community and to the larger society of which it is so important a part. Your predecessors labored to establish and uphold these standards, and we expect you to continue that commitment as you make your personal imprint on the life of this great institution. We charge you to defend and advance the work of the faculty, to cherish and respect the great tradition of academic freedom essential to our society, to lead by word and by deed those who themselves are looked to for wisdom and leadership. We entrust to you our hopes for the future of the university's very reason for being, our students. You are the first teacher among the company of teachers, and it is incumbent upon you and your colleagues to so nurture and instruct that those who study here will never question their choice of where to plan and build their futures. We ask that you never forget that the life of the university depends on the confidence and support of the people of Maine. As a land-grant institution, the university has always had the special mission of public service. But the university now has become more central to society than at any time in its history. Your responsibilities for economic development, for example, or for civic and cultural affairs approach those for education itself. Remember that in all respects, it is the people's business you do here. Your success is their success, and the university can, su can succeed only if they succeed. Madam President, we give to you the care, custody, and control of this respected institution, trusting that in you and through your every endeavor, the University of Maine shall achieve the fondest hopes of those who depend on it and who love it best. And now, having charged her with her responsibilities and before this company, declared our faith in her judgment and leadership, I, James H. Page, Chancellor of the University of Maine System, acting on behalf and at the behest of the Board of Trustees of that system, do hereby appoint, affirm, and declare Susan J. Hunter to be the 20th President of the University of Maine with all the rights and duties thereto pertaining. I now ask President Hunter to come forward and the University of Maine System Board of Trustees Vice Chair Admiral Gregory Johnson and the University of Maine Board of Visitors Chair Ann Lucy to join me in presenting President Hunter with the University of Maine Medallion.
Ladies and gentlemen, our President Hunter, please accept your medallion. And ladies and gentlemen, please welcome me, uh, join me in welcoming President Hunter as the 20th President of the University of Maine. Thank you, obviously, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chancellor Page. I appreciate the confidence you've shown in me and the chance to share the moment with you. We've known each other for years, really have, and we've worked together for years, and I value our friendship and the opportunity to work together. Thank you, Trustee Johnson and members of the University of Maine System Board of Trustees and my colleagues in leadership across the University of Maine System for your service on behalf of the people of Maine. Thank you, Ann Lucy, Chair of the University of Maine Board of Visitors. I want to thank all the members of the Board of Visitors for providing such valuable advice and support as I've, I've spent the last however many months, eight months as president. Welcome to members of the University of Maine community, students, faculty, staff, the cabinet, other administrators, and alumni, represented so well by Pre Provost Hecker, Professor Peterson, Ms. Beecham, Ms. Sants, and Mr. Peachy. And to all the friends of UMaine here today, including any legislators, your support and commitment to UMaine and the state are truly appreciated. First of all, thank you for being here, and let me say a special thank you to Chancellor Zimfer for setting the perfect tone for the day. Uh, as was stated earlier, we've known each other for about six years since she came to chair the NIAS review team. I have been inspired by, from afar, uh, but now I'm really even more inspired. She has very successfully taken on a behemoth of a job and just happens to be a woman. A few months ago, I was approached about having an, in, an installation, and I have to admit it was an event that I hadn't actually thought about. I think the prevailing opinion was that the first woman president, or any president for that matter, should not be an asterisk, so I said yes. With that, I turned all of the planning over to a committee headed by Provost Hecker and Vice President Kim, and I want to thank them and the committee for organizing all of the activities in this Women in Leadership Week. I do want to give a special thanks to my husband, Dave, who's sitting down in front here. As many of you know, Dave spent his career on campus. He is a plant pathologist and worked many years with the potato industry with his research based out of a rustic farm in Presque Isle. He is technically retired, but last fall tore the course for the University of Maine at Presque Isle and this summer is filling in at the plant disease clinic run by Cooperative Extension down on College Avenue. He is my perfect sounding board because he is an absolute vault. Sitting next to him is my brother, Bill, who came up from Boston today, and it means a lot to me that he was able to, to be here. Our children, Chris and Griff, are not here in person, but I know they're here in spirit. They live in Minneapolis and Seattle, respectively, and being in Orono for this event was not practically possible. I'm sure every family has its inside jokes. Several years ago, my daughter observed, quote, your career really took off once you ditched the kids, end quote. <laughs> I prefer to think that they took flight, uh, but it is true that when I took my first upper administrative job in July of 2005, they had both moved on and out. But what a difference 10 years has made. One last mention. In September of 2013, a few weeks after I had begun my job as Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs for the University of Maine System, there was a lovely going away event for me at Buchanan Alumni House. And I do appreciate everyone's graciousness when upon learning that I was returning to campus to serve as president, they did not ask me to return the Michael Lewis painting or any of the other gifts. I have been encouraged to reflect a bit on myself today, and I will admit that that is not really my comfort zone, but
but I'll try, and then move on to what I think is far more substantive and important. Periodically, people ask what elements contributed to my success. As many of you know, I've spent all but 10 months of my career at UMaine. That has pluses and minuses. Some might see it as too narrow and lacking the experience of working in other institutions. I'd like to think that the multiple and varied professional development experience I've engaged in throughout my career helped mitigate that concern. On the plus side, I have a deep familiarity that allows me to know which levers to push or whom to call. In a state with a small population that prizes relationships, it is very handy to have so many. I think the granularity has allowed me to form interesting and dynamic connections across a complicated but fascinating landscape. By fully integrating into this community, there has been a continuity of mission to my work. And I have been the beneficiary of wonderful mentoring. Dean Emeritus Bruce Wiersma hired me for my first administrative job, and from day one gave me access to the innermost workings of the college. My grad school advisors were the stuff of legend. A husband and wife team, Harold, a cell biologist, was my PhD advisor, and Rosemary, a biochemist, was a committee member and so much more. Her career included time as a provost and president, quite simply the most magnificent woman I have ever met. Rosemary's impact is, was so profound that although she died suddenly 23 years ago, I don't go more than a day or so without reflecting on her, sometimes thinking about how she would approach a problem, express a point, take the long view on an issue, plan a complicated strategy, a communication strategy about a complicated issue, or sometimes I would just wish she was available because I know we would laugh hysterically, which we often did. She was smart, analytical, and creative, and had an absolutely wonderful way with people. All traits I try to keep in mind. To this day, I still have folks with whom I consult and ask for advice. Sam Smith, President Emeritus of Washington State University, spent 15 years leading that university, a very successful land-grant president. I've known him since I was a master's student at Penn State, saw him last summer when we were out in Seattle visiting our son, and spoke to him just two weeks ago. Sam reminds me to look broadly. There are many portfolios to a president's job. He points out that the horizon is some distance away and that one shouldn't drive a car by staring at the hood ornament. <laughs> when I talk with students, I tell them to find something that they enjoy because then they will work very hard. Successful people work hard. Many years ago, while a student, I hit a few bumps in the road because I didn't focus and work as hard as I needed to. This was an object lesson that really stuck. There are no shortcuts, and once I really understood that, how to move forward was pretty clear. I realized some years ago that my daydreaming time was spent thinking about administration, not science. And that's when I knew what direction I should pursue full bore. Apparently, I'm comfortable with a high degree of ambiguity. We have a varied and complex landscape across the campus, the university system, and the state. I think I'm pretty good at high-level scanning until intense focus is needed, and then I drill in. In part, my ability to look across the landscape and make meaningful connections in seemingly dissimilar and disparate places has contributed to my success. And the last observation, is that there is a background hum about impending change, and with that comes concern about what it could mean, and that's okay. It keeps me on my toes. As we ask the tough questions, and we must ask them in order to be the best that we can be, the accompanying uncertainty keeps me focused on this institution, our students, and the idea that where done well, higher education has a profound and lasting impact on lives. I spent some time thinking about leadership, a thematic element of the week. I was drawn to a definition that describes leadership as derived from influence and can come from anyone at any level fulfilling any role. I do have influence built up over many years based on long working relationships, good work, and many jobs. I'm drawn to this focus on leadership because it doesn't rely on prominence of position. 
It is true that as you move up the organizational structure, you gain power. But you gain more authority by the use of less power. Persuading people to do things because it is in the collective best interest is a more powerful and reliable way to lead. Moving on, and I really do think it is more important to talk about the university. And in doing this, I'll look back on our history a bit and then look forward. The University of Maine has a legacy of 150 years as a leader of education and innovation for the state of Maine. Contributions run the gamut from Francis Crow, class of 1905, who was the construction engineer for the Hoover Dam, to Clifford McIntyre, class of 1930, who was the congressman who co-sponsored the McIntyre-Stennis Cooperative Forestry Research Program legislation. Then there is Edith Patch, master's degree in 1910, who pursued a lifetime of significant work here in Orono. She warned against the loss of insect pollinators due to indiscriminate use of pesticides many years before Rachel Carson published Silent Spring, and she was the first woman president of the Entomology Society of America. There was also Chuck Peddle, class of 1960, who was one of the founders of the microcomputer industry as lead developer of the chip that started the computer revolution of the 1970s and 80s. UMaine is where Phi Kappa Phi, the National Honor Society recognizing excellence in all academic disciplines, was founded. We boast alumni with national and international reputations in fields that span the range of human endeavor. We have well-known writers, a Tony Award-winning lighting designer, an Academy Award-winning film producer, and a Nobel Prize-winning physician among our 105,000 living alumni. This university was founded as a result of the Morrill Act passed by Congress in 1862. As you all know, 1862 was a pivotal time in America's history. The country was in, quote, the grim business of war, as historian Doris Kearns Goodwin describes it. Casualties and public discontent mounted. There were bitter debates about what to do about slavery. That summer, Lincoln was making decisions about emancipation. According to Kearns Goodwin, it was customary on the last day of the session for the president to sign the spate of bills rushed through in the final days of the term. It had been a productive session, and three historic bills that had been stalled for years were signed. The Homestead Act, which promised land to settlers largely in the West, the Pacific Railroad Act, making possible construction of the Transcontinental Railroad, and the Morrill Act, providing public lands to states for the establishment of land-grant colleges. At a time of crisis, with abundant doubt and uncertainty about the future of our country, here was bold, visionary legislation to chart a course for a very different future. The Maine College of Agriculture and the Mechanic Arts was founded on February 24, 1865. Women were allowed to enroll in 1872, and the name was changed to the University of Maine in 1897. The land-grant institutions created throughout the country were charged to teach, quote, agriculture, military tactics, the mechanic arts, and home economics, not to the exclusion of classical studies, end quote. The goal was to provide for the growth of a truly educated middle class prepared for the demands and realities of an industrialized world. In his annual address to the legislature in 1866, Governor Joshua Chamberlain noted that the land-grant university would benefit the prosperity of the state. Quote, we need something in the state which will educate our young men, not out of their proper sphere, but into it, end quote. Now let's look forward. I know we all embrace the mission of UMaine as the state's land-grant, sea-grant research university. We employ teaching strategies that engage students by utilizing current practice grounded in how people best learn a process that results in growth of both student and teacher. We conduct research and scholarship that is critically evaluated within the disciplines and in many fields attracts substantial external funding. We connect to and support the people and enterprises of the state of Maine. And in doing all of this, we insert students in real world ventures to inform their academic work and provide incredible growth opportunities. I believe that in many cases, it is within those engagements that passion and commitment to lifelong learning are discovered. 
20 years ago, national figures such as Dr. Harold Shapiro, president of Princeton University, was sounding the alarm about challenges facing higher education and urging prioritization and mission differentiation. The challenges have in no way abated. The pressures of rising costs, ballooning student debt, and unbundling of educational offerings are a few of the issues confronting us. In addition to these challenges faced by every institution of higher education in the country, Maine faces challenges associated with its demography and geography. That includes being a state not only with declining numbers of high school students, but all the, also the oldest median age population overall. A state where it is more important than ever to focus on the innovation needed to help prepare Maine industries for the 21st century, to promote health and well-being, to enhance education for students and teachers, and to engage communities. Given Maine's geographic size and dispersion of population, we need to work to enhance access to programming and coordinate our efforts to benefit Maine students, communities, and businesses. The University of Maine System Board of Trustees is committed to the campus locations, and UMaine stands ready to work with our sister campuses to meet Maine's challenges. In time and with strategic alignment in our academic and administrative functions, we will be able to work across the entire state as a network of campuses in a way that we have never before. I know this is complicated and ambiguous, but if we retain a laser focus on what is best for students and the people and enterprises of the state, we will be on the right path. The University of Maine's past and future leadership and commitment to this state are constants in forging the way forward. I think most everyone at UMaine is very assured about how our research and outreach activities work across the state to benefit so many. But I don't think we've thought enough about how we should contribute to instruction statewide and articulate this as part of UMaine's ongoing commitment to leadership and excellence. I'm not remotely suggesting we won't have thousands of students on the UMaine campus engaged in on-site higher education. Those students will be doing research with faculty, playing in the band, writing for the Maine campus, and engaging with Maine communities as part of their total educational experience. The evaluation of the entire academic portfolio offered system-wide is already underway, and critical decisions will have to be made. Our task is going to be leveraging the considerable assets we have at UMaine to enhance academic opportunities elsewhere and help serve a broader audience while continuing to take a leadership position in the system and the state. The University of Maine is a true research university, and that won't change. Looking to the years ahead, faculty and students at all locations will benefit from collaborative opportunities, and the research enterprise collectively will benefit from the ability to be connected to a greater number of regional enterprises. Our outreach efforts, epitomized by but not limited to cooperative extension, are already distributed and operational statewide. I think going forward, we will be able to provide greater student opportunities, thereby increasing the total outreach initiative and enhancing the collective academic experience. We have to remake our enterprise to serve 21st century students and give them the skills, knowledge, and experiences that set them up for success in a knowledge-driven global economy. At the same time, we must enhance the strength, reputation, and capabilities we have as a research university. These are consonant objectives and can be realized through efforts to align and unify as a coordinated entity, with Humane continuing to work as a partner with all constituencies, internal and external. It is within this context that you will that UMaine will continue to engage with our system of campuses, the chancellor, board of trustees, and citizens of the state of Maine. In closing the circle, I want to offer a bit of imagery that Rosemary used many years ago. She used to speak of needing to thread one's way through a complex situation, and I think it's an apt metaphor for the path forward. It will not be a straight line, point A to point B journey but rather a maze with complex twists and turns. There will be challenges, for sure, as well as opportune moments for significant progress. 
Let's reflect on 1862. People made bold decisions to pave the way for a very different future in spite of the profound crises and uncertainties of those times. They could not see the future clearly any more than we can, but they made decisions based on a belief that change was coming and they would be positioning society to be better equipped to deal with it. I would ask that we would be as brave. This is a wonderful university and I am truly honored to serve as its president. I do believe in the power of education to markedly change and improve lives. And it is increasingly important that public higher education fulfill that role for the citizens of Maine. It will take all of us working collectively to turn that belief into reality. So thank you for all you do to contribute to a brighter future for the people of Maine. Thank you.
Thank you all very much for being part of the installation of the 20th President of the University of Maine. Particular thanks to our sponsor, TIA CREF. We'd also like to thank all Maine women, senior skulls, and Army ROTC for their participation today. I encourage you to join us upstairs in the Hudson Museum for refreshments and musical entertainment provided by the UMaine female acapella group, Renaissance. Thank you very much.